Hey everybody, I hope you've either had or will um, have had a happy and uh, cloudless eclipse. Um, this week we're obviously meeting online so that you all can enjoy the cosmic event. Um, we're going to talk just um, briefly, somewhat compared to our regular two-hour class, about descriptive statistics, um, which will be review for many of you. I hope there'll be at least some new material in here, but it's really fundamental for a lot of what you're going to be doing this semester. Um, in terms of thinking about quantitative analysis, we really start with descriptive or summary statistics to think about, um, you know, how do we describe data and how do we think about, you know, quantitative analysis more, more broadly and, and what we do with those things. So today what I want to do is just talk briefly about um, how I think about statistics. Um, hopefully you all have already posted online. There's a question this week um, related to how you define statistics. Um, we'll run through me measures of central tendency and dispersion and then talk briefly about spatial data and how spatial data um, work and all of that. So um, hopefully we'll try to make this um, entertaining and as painless as possible. So um, just before we get started, just to uh, remind you all that next week we will meet. Um, labs also meet this week, but next week we'll be meeting. We're going to talk about critical GIS, which is kind of thinking through how GIS works in society, um, the kind of big picture questions about how GIS works. It's kind of a frame for how we're moving through the course. We're also going to talk about map projections, which are a really important part of cartography and thinking about how do we represent a 3D surface on a 2D um, flat image. Um, there's lots of different ways to do it, and you'll learn all about them. So um, we are, yes, talking about statistics this week. Um, you posted this week a question about what, how would you define statistics, not a dictionary definition, but just how do you think about them, and then what are they good for, right? So we live in a society where there's a whole lot of stats. We see a whole lot of numbers and graphs in the course of our life, and so I asked you to think about, well, what, what do these do, and what do they miss? What can't they do? What can't numbers tell us? Um, so hopefully you all have kind of done that. You can look through some of your classmates' responses. Um, you could look up the dictionary definition of statistics, which I'm sure some of you did. Uh, Merriam-Webster defines this as a branch of mathematics dealing with a collection, analysis, interpretation, and presentation of masses of numerical data, which basically has, is, is just saying we're just working with numbers, right? We're just saying here's what, uh, let's understand what's going on in numbers, in numerical data, in all sorts of ways, collecting it, analyzing it, presenting it to other people. It's pretty broad and all-encompassing. Chances are when most of you think of um, statistical analysis, you think of data that looks somewhat like this. Um, this is data on climate, similar to what you're going to be working on in the lab um, for this course. Um, from the data set, um, and you're thinking about how do we analyze numbers on, say, maximum temperature, the Tmax variable here, or you're going to be looking at precipitation, which is the PRCP variable and what you see here. You might even try to graph it out to make it a little bit easier to understand. Here is looking at maximum temperature by census region, right? And you can see the south really stands out <laughs> as, in terms of temperature as compared to some of the other regions that are out there, even the west, which is kind of surprising um, to me looking at it as well. And certainly this is all, all good. I think the, um, the thing I would point out is that this is a very kind of pot, what we would call positivist understanding of statistics. That is, it's just a way of describing the world through numbers. Um, you know, and oftentimes what we think about what we want numerical analysis to do, it's to dis distinguish between um, what some people have called the signal and the noise. That is, all the background information that's just random. There's just randomness in the world, right? How do we find the pattern? How do we find that that signal underneath all of this? So the the um, graph you're looking at here is of um, reconstructed temperature records of, of um, over the last three or four thousand years based on climate data that people have collected over time. And it's the famously called the hockey stick graph because as you can see, if I bring in my mouse here, you know, it kind of buzzes along. And there's some randomness here, right? You see year to year there's quite a bit of variation, but it's kind of flat more or less until the last 100, 150 years when it shoots up. This is the... the you know, bottom part of the hockey stick, so to speak. Um, that's, the, that's the signal, right? Flat and then turning, and then there's a lot of year-to-year -year variation. So, of course, you know, each year is different, temperatures are different, but we see a clear signal at the end that something is changing right, that's different than what all came before. And that's what statistics are really supposed to do. It presumes there is a pattern there to find, and that the pattern itself is what's really important and what we're looking at. 
So if you think about, you know, what can stats do? Stats are really good at things like identifying trends, like the trend that we just saw. Um, they can identify, here's, here's something, you know, we can weed out the signal from the noise, so to speak, and identify what the, the broader pattern is. Um, it can confirm differences between groups. You can think about things like drug trials, right? Or if we think about, um, you know, is one city different from another city in terms of economic growth? Um, stats are really good at, at doing things like that. And then it can also find associations. So it can associate two variables with each other. So, um, you know, famously, one of the leading economic indicators that are out there is production of cardboard boxes. Um, if you see production of cardboard boxes going up, um, that tends to be a leading indicator of economic growth because people are preparing to ship things, right? There's, a, there's orders are increasing, and it says that there's this anticipation that economic activity will be increasing over time. Stats are really good at all those things. It can kind of do very complex analysis along all three of those lines. Stats, however, can't do some things as well. They can't interpret themselves. So oftentimes as a statistician, you might see a difference and that, num that numerical difference is there. There's some kind of pattern, but it can't tell you why that's important. It can't say, here's what the story is that this tells. It needs somebody on the other side of the computer screen to do that. It also can't ask the right questions. Right. So, um, I, you know, we talked about obesity in our first class. I, I think that's an area where we have to think about well, what is the right question to ask about this in terms of what the causes are. And is obesity really the thing that we're supposed to be focusing on as the main problem? Or is there a broader set of things that we should be looking at? Basically, what are we looking at? Where's our analysis headed? Stats can't tell you exactly what the right answer to that is. It can do whatever you want it to do, but they're just a set of tools um, that can be used for that purpose. And it also can't correct faulty data. So oftentimes we talk about things like big data, right, that, we, that now we have all this information that we didn't used to have um, before. And what stats can't do is tell you, you know, here's what's um, wrong in your data. You can identify outliers. You can do some tweaking with stats. But if the data is bad going in, stats are going to give you bad results coming out. And that's something that you as an analyst have to go in and try to understand what's going on with these data. Are they set to analyze? And frankly, that's over half the time, oftentimes in quantitative analysis um, as well. Um, you could also talk about qualitative analysis, you know, using words and things. Those are really good at, say, getting at complex relationships that are really hard for stats or getting at cause-effect relationships um, that statistics can't get into as well. So. When you talk about descriptive statistics, we often have descriptive in statistics and inferential statistics. We're not going to talk so much about the second one in this course. We are going to talk today about the first one, that is describing data, not taking small amounts of data and generalizing to a larger audience. Um, the two main questions that we ask with descriptive statistics are, where's the middle? What's the central tendency? right? And what's the distribution? How spread out is the data? in terms of, of how we're looking at it. So where's the center of the data and how spread out? What's the shape, overall distribution of those data? And both of those are important. We tend to focus a lot on the first question, generally, as a culture. Like, we're really concerned with what's the average. And, and we tend to treat then outliers as somehow abnormal. That's not necessarily the case. Outliers are normal. That happens, right? And that's part of any distribution. And it's just understanding how that's all put together. So let's start with thinking about central tendency. We'll start with this sample data set, um, really random, you know, set of numbers. It, let's say this is the number of sodas consumed by five UG undergrads over two weeks. You asked five people to consume, you know, keep track of how many cans of, of soda they consume. Or if you're from the Midwest, you call it pop. All right. Student one did 25 sodas. Student two did 51. Student three, 29. Student four, 14. Student five, 13. All right. How do we understand what's going on? That's a set of numbers, right? What stats are going to do? Descriptive stats are going to say, what's the center of these data and what's the distribution in terms of how they look, right? So there's three measures of central tendency that can help us with this. Um, so the mean, as many of you know, right, is the average uh, value. So it's the thing that's kind of in the middle statistically. If you assume things are spread out, you take kind of all the values and say, what's the one in the middle? It's usually shown as this what's called X bar. So this X with a bar on top of it um, is sometimes the, the term that's used for that. And we just add up all the values and divide by the number of observations, right? So in this case, we would do 25 plus 51 plus 29 plus 14 plus 13, divide by 5, and we get 26.4. The average number of sodas consumed is 26.4. Okay, easy enough. The second um, option that we've got is the median. And the mean and median are both used a fair amount. We'll talk about um, 
I think the more important thing for this course is thinking about when to use each one. But the median is the value that's in the middle, right? So in the mean, you add everything up and then you divide by the total n, the, the number of observations. The median is literally the middle value. So you say if we have 50 observations, we take in the one in the middle. We take um, 25 and 26, actually, in that case, and average them. If we had 49 observations, we would take 25. In this case, we have five observations, so we take whatever one's in the middle, right? So in this case, if we line them up from most of these, we've got 13, 14, 25, 29, 51. 25 is the median, right? And so the median is best for skewed data. And if you look at this data set, you can think about why, right? So we've got 13 and 14, 25 and 29. That's kind of all clustered together, teens, 20s. And then we've got 51 at the end. That would be a statistical outlier. And that outlier, the skewed data, and we'll talk about skew in a, in a little bit later on in this um, lecture, but that skewed data, this value that if in this graph is all the way out here, right? That is... Um, a, a data point that can pull the mean too far in one direction. So in this case, x bar, you can see down here, is pulled too far to the right, and the median sits right here. And that can actually be a truer measure of the middle of the data set. In this case, it's not a drastic difference, 26 versus 25, but in some cases, um, when we look at things like, say, income, it can be really significant as well. Um, and then mode, some of you might know, is the, the value that is uh, the most common. So it, for numerical data, the mode's not really all that useful, you know, because you can have a zero that shows up a lot, and that's not that exciting. I mean, it has some value, but it's not that big a deal. But it is really helpful for qualitative data, for what's called categorical data. And we'll talk about types of data later on in the semester, but categorical data, data that's um, text and not numbers, right? So what if instead of the number of sodas you drank, we asked, which soda did you drink? And we ended up with this tally, Diet Coke, Coke Zero, Coke, Mountain Dew, Diet Mountain Dew, and Sprite, right? The, the, you can't average Coke and Diet Coke. Like, you can't add those two things up. But what you can do is say, well, which one of these showed up most often? And in this case, that would be Mountain Dew, right? Mountain Dew showed up 30 times. Actually, sorry, Coke. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Coke showed up 31 times. That would be the mode in this case, right? And that would be what you would look at as being the middle of the data. That's the most common response. And it makes more sense when you're dealing with categorical data like that. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to um, take a minute. And if you've got a sheet of paper where you're sitting, um, take a look at this is uh, five different variables. And you'll just have to do some guessing on this. Don't worry too much about it. Um, but you've got five variables. Household income, say at the county level percent of the county population that's less than age 25, and think about Clark County here particularly. Shirt collar on, uh, color on game days, if you were walking through UGA campus, what shirt color people are wearing. Um, adult height in Clark County, and rainfall by month in a particular state. And I would ask you to think about what's the appropriate measure of central tendency for each of these five points. So take 30 seconds, jot down some notes, and then we'll go over them. And also pause this recording if you need a second. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about this. Um, so let's run through these one by one. So household incomes would generally be, I think, seen as median. Um, income is a classic variable that's very positively skewed. If you look at income distribution, you have um, a few, we might call them the 1%, right, of folks who have extremely high incomes in most economies. Right. Then you have the bulk of people that exist, you know, so let's say median incomes of forty to sixty thousand dollars a year. But that those high income earners, let's say more than five hundred thousand dollars a year, would pull the data set too far to the right. And so we would um, use median. So you almost always see household income measured in median. Similarly, percent of county population under age 25 will have outliers as well. And that's the way you want to think about this is would there be outliers? I would say think about Clark County in relation to the rest of Georgia. Clark County would really be an outlier with this. We have something like 20 percent of our population is under age 25, where for many places it's going to or under age 25. It might actually be more like 30 or 40 percent. Many places might be more like 20 percent as well, because we have such a high college um, age population. I think that's what we're doing. 
Shirt color and game days. Shirt color is a categorical variable. It's a, it's a color, right? Red, black, you know, white, whatever color else that you'd see. Um, you'd be counting each one of those, and you know, which one shows up most often. Chances are, I'm assuming red, right, would be your mode of shirt color and game days. Adult height in Clark County, um, we would use mean. Um, I would think that is a variable that there would be outliers potentially on both sides. Maybe a little positively skewed. You'd maybe have a few more people that are, you know, close to seven foot than you would people under five foot. Um, but generally, I'd think of that as a fairly symmetrical or normal distribution. And then rainfall by month in a state. Um, if you're taking the same state over time, again, I would think of that as being more or less fairly random um, around a central point and normally distributed. And so mean might be a good um, variable there. If I was going to ask you this question on an exam, right, or if we're looking at this on a test, um, you know, I would kind of give you a data set and say, here, look at the distribution of these data. And what do you think the best measure of central tendency is? Okay, so if we're going to talk about how to assess distribution, we just talked about central tendency. Let's talk about the shape of a data set. We have lots of visual tools that can help with this. And visual um, representations, graphing, can be a really useful way to um, look at data in a very concise way. You can have 50,000 records, but if you look at, this is called a histogram, what you're seeing on the screen right now. Um, I'm actually going to minimize myself so you can see the whole thing. Um, so um, if you look at the histogram that you see right now, you can um, see the overall distribution. So what we're looking at here is variables from the census. It is um, the percent of the population whose highest edu educational attainment is some college. So um, that that um, some that people have gone and attended some uh, amount of college but don't have a degree to show for it. And you can see this is a fairly normal looking distribution. A histogram just says um, we're going to do the count. So here we see the count of counties. In this case, this is for Georgia the number of counties that fall into each range. So here we've got, you know, this is roughly maybe 0.7% or something like that. So 20 to 21, 21 to 22, 22 to 23, et cetera, things like that. And the highest value is around here around 26%, like 20 counties are around 26% in terms of this variable, right? But there's counties at the high end, there's counties at the low end in terms of how it's set up. And we can just say, okay, what does it look like? Is it kind of symmetrical? Does it have two humps and rather than one hump? Um, you know, is it really wide? Is it really narrow? That's something called kurtosis. There's lots of different um, language that we have about that. Um, we're gonna talk about skew being one of the main ones here in a bit. Um, there's other ways of doing this though. So this is something called a box plot. There's many, many ways to talk about distribution. We're going to look at histograms and box plots. So box plot um, is a little bit different. Most of you have seen one of these before, but it's pretty common. This is sometimes called a box and, box and whiskers plot. And what you've got here is um, you've got a median that's the middle here. So this line represents the median. Again, you see it's around 26-ish, something like that, is the middle of this data set um, in terms of highest educational attainment, same variable. This, these two lines here represent the middle 50% of the data. So the 25th percentile is this bottom line, and the 75th percentile is this top line. And then there's lines that go out that represent the regular range um, that, that's generally 1.5 uh, times the what's called the IQR. We'll talk about that in a second. And then you have outliers at the top and at the bottom that fall beyond that range that you can identify as well. So it's a really quick and dirty way to look at the kind of basic numbers that you um, that matter to you. Histograms are much more detailed. They provide a much more fine grain view of variation all along the spectrum. Um, but box plots summarize them in a more concise way. Right, so we can look at both of these together and kind of try to understand, you know, what does the distribution look like? Again, I say this box also looks pretty normal. The area above the line here in this box, sorry, my mouse is lagging, and the area below this line are both pretty um, equal. All right, and then you have a few outliers on either side, which I think show up in the histogram as well. But we can also use these to compare. So what if we wanted to compare Georgia to Texas? Right. And what we see here is we can tell that in Texas, um, Texas has a few more counties than Georgia does, but actually Georgia is number two nationally in the number of counties that um, folks have. Um, you can see for Texas, the distribution and my mouse has disappeared again. Um, so I don't have a way to show this to you. But if you look at this, the um, 
the mean value is slightly higher for Texas. And you can see it's a little more concentrated, right? It's a little less dispersed, and it's maybe a slightly more skewed negatively, I would say. You'd say the side that falls off toward the 20 is a little bit um, longer than the side that goes up um, positively toward 40 in this case. Right, and so histograms allow you to kind of do that, but box plots are a little bit more effective, I would argue, um, potentially. So here, if you look at the same data, you can see here the median for Texas is noticeably higher, right? And that 50% range, that, that box part of the box plot, um, also goes pretty higher as well. You can even do this with all the states in the Southeast, right? So now we can really look at this and see lots of data, data on every county in the Southeast um, for this one variable, and think about how are their distributions similar or different? right, given what we know about how box plots work. work. And so I'm actually going to ask you to do that. I'm going to ask you to pause this recording, right, and take a look at this graph. So you see along the bottom here, and I wish I had my mouse back and I would, oh, there it is. Okay. So you see along the bottom here, you've got Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, etc. And you see the distribution on the box plot. I'm going to ask you to pause this video, go on to ELC, there's a discussion forum set up for this, and say, what story does this graph tell? Maybe pick out two headlines, two things you learn looking at this graph about the distribution of this variable, of the, the number of folks who have at least some level of college or have as their maximum some level of college attainment. So go ahead and pause, um, write you know, 50 to 100 words. This counts for your attendance. It shows me that you read, you watched this video and that you've responded to it in some way. Okay, so hopefully you've done that. Let's go ahead and jump back in. So we can also create measures of distribution. Um, so we can talk about what, how spread is the data set and we have numbers for that, right? And some of you will know where this is going, things like standard deviation, IQR, things like that. So let's just pretend like, for instance, we're looking at poker hands and we've got one hand that's a full house, 44466, four, four, six, another one that's 248810. Which of those is more dispersed? Which is more spread out? Right? And we could say, well, let's we'll just look at it and eyeball it and say what we think. But how could we measure that? How could we quantify it? Right? We want to be statisticians. We don't just want to do guesswork. So you can think about that for a second. One, one easy option is, right, let's just look at the range. Um, so we've got, on the one hand, 4 to 6. That's only 2. The other one goes from 2 to 10. That's 8. That's really big. Um, and so you could say, well, the full house is obviously much tighter together. The problem is... Um, that it's too sensitive to extremes. So what if that pair of eights hand was literally seven, seven, eight, eight, ten, right? And the full house was four, 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 seven, seven. They would both have a range of, um, you know, three-ish, right? But the seven, seven, eight, eight, ten would be potentially much more tightly clustered. Outliers can just mess with stuff if you just look at the range, and so it's not that's not cool. The second option would be to um, say, well, let's just say, what about the average distance to the mean? So if we don't just take the top and bottom values, how about we just say, we'll take the mean and say, how far is each number from it? Um, so um, just for instance, right, you've got 2, 4, 8, 8, and 10. Uh, don't mind the typo on this slide. Um, that has a mean of 6.6, .6, right? And we could take each of those values, so 2, and say, well, how far it is, is it from 6.6? .6? Well, 2 minus 6.6 .6 is 4.4. .4 right? 5 minus 6.6 .6 is negative 1.6, right? And you could do all those up and just add and say, what's the average distance from the mean? Um, so you try that with the values that are above. So um, you add 4, 4, 4, 6, 6, find the mean, um, 2, 4, 8, 8, and 10, find the mean, and subtract the mean from all the values and add up the numbers that you get, all right? So pause the video, take a minute or two, try to do that. Okay. Um, so if you've done that, um, you've realized that the sum of all those values will, of course, be zero, right? So that uh, that doesn't quite work because the, the lower values cancel out the higher values. That's just how the mean works in this case. So um, instead, what we do is we figure out what, what about the absolute distance from the mean. So we do the same thing. We, we take 2 and subtract 6.6. .6, or, um, and we get 4.6, but we take the absolute value of that. So we say the average distance is always a positive value, and that does give you a meaningful number. In this case, it would be 2.48.
right, would be the, the number that we would look at. And the standard deviation is really just a variation on that. So we take the distances between observations, right? So um, if you want to kind of get into the math here, we've got any one observation, we subtract the mean, and we divide it by the number of values. So we say the average distance. We do n minus 1 for statistical reasons that we don't worry about too much here. Um, we square the values and take the square root. That's just an easy way algebraically to get an absolute value. It, it was harder back in the day to um, get computers to understand absolute values, so they just squared and took the square root to make things positive in terms of how it looked. And the standard deviation is really cool. In a, a normal distribution, roughly 68% um, of all values fall within one standard deviation of the mean. And we can do all sorts of statistics based on that. It's a really important um, pivotal part of how statistics work. Um, but standard deviation doesn't tell us everything, right? So we also have something called the coefficient of variation. The coefficient of variation um, allows us to compare standard deviations with different means. So a really easy example I sometimes use is like um, the uh, SAT versus ACT. Standard deviation of both of those are hard to compare. You can't compare the standard deviation of SAT scores with ACT scores because they're using different, um, I'm going to turn my screen off here again. Uh, they're using different scales, right? Or here we've got an example where we think about um, rainfall, right? So rainfall um, can vary a lot. In the southeast is actually pretty wet. The northwest is pretty wet. And if we look at the standard deviation of counties, right? You'll see a lot of variation in the south from year to year, but there's also a really high mean there. So if you have 10 inches of rain a year plus or minus 3 versus 2 inches of rain a year plus or minus 2, 3 looks bigger when you look at the standard deviation, but the, the standard deviation of 2 is functionally a bigger variation relative to the mean. So what a coefficient of variation measures is it's just the standard deviation divided by the mean. And it gives you some ratio of those two together. And it can be a really helpful shorthand for understanding the distribution of data in that way. Um, interquartile range is um, one other uh, measure. Um, this is kind of like median, so it's not so sensitive to outliers. The same thing, standard deviation can be really affected by the fact that you might have one observation that's really far out that has a really high distance. So what interquartile range does is it basically measures what's the top to the bottom of this box right here, right? It says, um, take the value of the 25th and the 75th percentile and measure the di distance between them. And it says, where's the middle of your data? What's the middle 50% of observations? And again, you can look at that relative to the median and get a sense of how much variation there is relative to the overall center of the data. Um, lastly, we can just talk about outliers um, as well. So outliers are really helpful to identify. Sometimes you want to include them in your analysis. Sometimes you don't. Um, generally, we take what's called the interquartile range, right? So we've got the IQR. And then we add, we multiply it times 1.5. And that's where you see these whiskers on the top of this box plot. And then anything above that threshold, right? So the median plus 1.5 times the IQ, or sorry, the, media, the 75th value plus 75% of the IQR. Um, uh, or 150% of the IQR, sorry. Getting tripped up over the numbers myself. And then you'd have um, any values above that. So if you had a data set where the um, me median was 50, the IQR was um, 50, right? You take 75 plus 75, um, 150 would be your, your top value in that case. You can see it um, listed out here. This is a little bit clearer explanation in terms of how that's set up. Um, OK, real quick skew, and then we're going to wrap up. So we've talked about negative skew and positive skew. We've talked about that already. It's whether or not you've got extreme outliers in the low end or the high end. Um, generally, the, the shorthand way is looking at the median and the mode. If you have a positive outlier, the mean will be higher than the median. If you have a um, negative skew, the mean will be lower than the median. Again, the, the mean is more sensitive to get pulled in the direction of the outliers. So the median will stay kind of in the middle. If the median and the mean are really close, then congratulations, you have a pretty much a normal distribution in that case as well. Last slide here, um, we can talk about how spatial data is different. Um, so descriptive statistics just deal with the numbers. There are descriptive spatial statistics that we won't get into in this class too much, but they, do, they ask basically where, where do things happen? So we've got the mean center, clustering, spatial diffusion, things like this. We could say, what's the mean center, say, of population in the United States? Basically, where's the kind of average location of where people live? And that's something that's changed over time. Back in the 1700s, it was in the Appalachian Mountains somewhere. Now it's in Kansas 
because people have spread west over time. We can say where are hot spots and cold spots for disease, right, or for poverty. Right, and we can use measures of clustering to look at that as well. There's also measures of spatial diffusion. Think about if we're thinking about, say, a virus spreading over space, right? And we can do spatial statistics to understand how quickly things spread over space as well. So um, just be aware that those exist and what some of those examples are, um, what some of those terms are as well. Okay, so just to review what we've talked about here, we've talked about well, what can stats do? What are they good at? right? Um, kind of what do we think about what statistics are? My shorthand is always they could, they're about telling stories with data, identifying meaningful patterns within data, right? We've looked at measures of central tendency and when to use them. Um, so mean, median, and mode, and when it's appropriate to use each one of those. And then looking at visualizing and measuring the distribution of data and different statistics and visualization techniques to do that as well. Next week, just as a reminder, we're going to talk about critical GIS, map projections, things like that. Uh, make sure you do the reading. Um, look forward to seeing you all, and again, hope you had a very um, interesting and cloudless eclipse. Thanks.